Okay. We good right here, Rosie? I can't quite tell from here. Okay. Um, I'm all too aware that I am in between 200 plus people and their lunch and bathroom. So I will try to keep this quick. Rosie, we're going to go a little over one o'clock. Is that okay? All right. Uh, thanks for FISA for inviting me to come talk about this topic, which I uh, quite personal, personally are I'm very excited about, both as a rowing coach and also as a product developer. Um, thanks, Peter, for the nice introduction. I think it's the first time in my life I've been called a top mind. <laughs> Um, and I think uh, some, other, some other thanks uh, need to go out to, to three people who, who really have helped make, help us get the sport where it is right now. And that's Valerie Kleshnev, Connie Draper, and Volker Nolte. And the work that they've done on understanding this highly complicated and highly dynamic uh, motions in our sport, um, the work that they've done combined with technology sort of coming to a place that's more accessible in our sport. It's, we're in an exciting time in this sport. We really are. Um, and uh, so it's a, it's a great topic today to talk about the technology and making boats go faster. Okay. So I'm going to break this into uh, three sections. Going to talk briefly about technology, the specific system that uh, Nielsen Kellerman represents that I know the, the most about. We're going to talk about what makes a boat go faster and then put it all together. Okay. Uh, first and foremost, this system is based on the Speedcoach GPS. Um, I, I am going to assume that everybody pretty much knows what this is, um, but I do want to point out that this is a product, a device that's measuring performance outputs. Okay, so it does a good job of, of measuring your stroke rate and your speed, your splits. We need to know this thing because we need to know how fast we're going. We, we, we have a target of what we're trying to uh, accomplish for our race. So we have to measure those performance outputs. But I think that something that's frustrated us as a sport is, so I, I make a change and I go faster, one stroke over the next. Well, what exactly did I do? I think I had a better stroke. I think I was more efficient. It went faster, so that was, that was probably good. Um, but we're measuring the performance output. And so the thing that I feel like we've really been sort of begging for, dying for, is an accessible way to measure the inputs. And that's where uh, the Empower Warlock comes in. So the Empower Warlock is measuring, uh, at a very high frequency, it's measuring angle and force. So throughout the stroke, we're taking lots and lots of measurements of angle and force. At the end of the stroke, we then compile that into a nice neat package of 12 numbers, and we send it wirelessly up to the speed coach. Okay, so the system that we're talking about today is one of each. Something that's measuring our inputs as an athlete, and something that's measuring and displaying our outputs and the, displaying the inputs. Okay, so uh, I do briefly want to talk about some, some uh, sort of design guidelines that we went through when, when developing this system. Um, it, it'll help explain why it is what it is and why it isn't some other things. Okay, so first, uh, our number one priority in making this thing is that its goal was to help next stroke improvement. So Valerie had uh, a, nice, a nice slide that talked about it was uh, understanding on the, on the far right and correction on the left. We are far left, okay? So this system is intended to help correction. Um, we, you can do analysis after the row to help your next session. That's all fine. You can do that, but what I'm going to talk about today is more on the how you can help your next stroke to make that boat go faster. Number two, our second design principle for this is that it had to be objective feedback. So we were not going to have anything that was left to be subjective. 
Um, so sort of my guiding light on this was I wanted the coach to be able to provide the athletes with a target and the athletes to know whether or not they were successful in hitting it on their last stroke. End of story. Okay, so that, that helped us when we had a certain design decision to make. Were we gonna do this or are we gonna do that? Well, does it, can the coach provide an athlete and will the athlete know if they were successful? If so, we can put it in. So here's an example of exactly that. Because the number one question I get when I talk about this is, oh, it has force curves. It doesn't have force curves. Here's why. Let's just say that we, I'm your coach, I'm everyone here's coach, and let's just say that we have decided that my little scribbled PowerPoint line is an ideal stroke curve, force curve for each and every one of you. All right, so study it. We're gonna go row, and you're gonna have to know if you're successful or not on each stroke. And we're gonna row in Philadelphia, that's where I coach. So we're gonna go out and row, and what I've set up here is for two and a half seconds, we're gonna take a stroke, and then for one second, I'm gonna show you your performance. So as if you're looking at the display. You have to decide if you're successful in your strokes. Okay, does everybody know which strokes they were successful on? So here's where, you know, as a coach, it's like make it a little steeper, make it a little taller, a little flatter. These are all great things. I am not bashing in any way a force curve. I think it's quite valuable. But our design criteria was objective feedback. Can the coach give you a target and will the athlete know if they're successful? So conversely, what we decided Okay, let's take that same force curve, and we're gonna identify a few key points. Um, Milan touched on this briefly, but just for convention, for this system, zero degrees is perpendicular to the boat, by definition, that's zero degrees. As I go further and further to the catch, that's gonna be a greater negative angle, and as I go further to the finish, that's going to be a greater positive angle. Okay, so we got that definition. So we're going to assume now that our ideal curve is defined at 60 degrees at the catch, 35 degrees at the finish, with a peak force at minus 25 degrees. All right, so we'll just, this is just all made up, but let's just assume that this is what we've decided our ideal is. And what I'd like you to do when you're rowing this time is I want you to row at 95 degrees length with a peak force at minus 25 degrees. That's your job. So everybody here is gonna go rowing again. Your job is minus 25 peak force, 95 degrees angle. Back to Philly we go. Minus 25, 95. Okay, do we know which strokes we were successful and which ones we weren't, and by how much we missed? All right, so this was, when I go back to that uh, objective feedback as a design criteria, when I'm asked, do we have force curves? No, we don't display force curves because we really wanted to focus on objective feedback. All right, design point number three. I'm a coach myself, I, uh, I coach part-time. Uh, I don't have a lot of time to think about this outside of my time on the water, so um, we decided we wanted to make this supplemental to your standard practice. So that meant you didn't have to do anything outside of a typical practice, you didn't have to do anything in your office afterwards if you didn't want to, that this system had to be productive while you were on the water doing the things that you already do. So it's supplemental to you as coaches. And finally, this had to be an everyday tool. Um, with with you know, experience with systems that I've either used or heard of people using in the past, it comes out once a, once a year for a week. 
and you know it's doing its job in, in educating the coaches as to what their athletes are doing. But again, this was our goal for what we wanted for our system. This was an everyday tool. Don't break it out once a week, uh, once a year for a week. Okay, so some screens that you might see. So boiling down that, the complex biomechanics and, uh, and effort measurements and boiling it down into something that the athlete can understand. Here are some example screens. And these are things we call skill screens. Um, if you're, if you're all familiar with the, with the normal functioning of the, of the speed coach, there are typically four windows of information. Uh, when we were developing this, you know, I realized we're going to put this in the hands of rowers, primarily sweep rowers, who have never used a speed coach before and didn't have to know what the stroke rate was because they're following the person in front of them. And they didn't have to know what the speed was because they had a job to do. So what we did is we created these skill screens so it made it really easy for coach to say, guys, we're going to work on the catch today. Go to the catch screen. Button, button, up, oh, there's the catch. Okay, so you don't have to mess around with buttons. So that was um, all about making this easier for the coach and the, and the athlete to communicate. This catch screen is showing simply your catch angle and your slip. And slip is defined as the, the difference between the catch where we change in direction and the point at which we get either 100 newtons or 200 newtons of force and it's 100 newtons for uh, sculling, 200 newtons for sweep. So we, since we're measuring that at a high resolution, we know exactly those angles. So that's what we've defined as our inefficiency at the catch. So we're working on the catch today, guys. This is all you need to know. This is all you should see. So we made this catch screen. Likewise, uh, finish. So the finish screen is simply the finish angle. And wash. Wash is, is defined as the point at which we go under that 100 or 200 Newton threshold and the difference between that point and our, and our finish angle. So this just tells us, you know, hey, we shouldn't be finishing way back here in the mid 40s. We should be finishing around 38, let's say. And when we do that, we reduce that amount of wash because we've just gone low and inefficient. So we're working on finishes today. So we made a screen for that. Uh, one of my favorite screens uh, this is super simple for um, team boats. Really effective is called length. And length is showing the total length at the top and at the bottom it's showing your catch angle and your finish angle. So the reason I love this for team boats so much is because you can put this, you have this in your eight and you say, guys, our target is 55 degrees at the catch, 35 degrees at the finish. Go, I'll meet you in a mile. Go figure out what, where your foot stretchers need to be to hit those angles. And as I'll show you later, it actually, just that makes the boat go faster. And finally, power. So if we're training, and this is the big one, um, talked about technique so far, but power to me is super important because we really haven't had a way to say, uh, you know, train today, you go with this split. Well, what if I'm in a headwind? What if I'm going against the current? What if I'm in a tailwind this time? So am I, what's my effort? Should I go a little faster? Should I go a little slower? No, actually to get the, tra the prescribed training plan, you should actually just go on power. Um, and I won't get into the physiological elements of this, but, but to me, I'm very convinced that if you're doing recovery and, uh, and steady state, you should use heart rate. And if you're doing any of the uh, interval training, you should use power exclusively. Okay, what are the elements that make the boat go faster? Real quick here, I think we can hopefully agree on these, that how this technology can help in four ways. The biggest way that we can make our boats go faster is to optimize our athletes, and that's both technically and um, with their strength and conditioning. The second way is to optimize our lineup. So now we have our athletes optimized. Let's pick our best ones, put them in the boat, and let's put them in the right seats. This is killing me. All right. Now we've got our athletes in the right lineup. Let's get them in the right boat using the right oars with the right rig. 
And finally, let's make sure that they're all doing the same thing at the same time. So now we're going to get into the practical piece of this. We're going to tie it all together, technology to make the boat go faster. So this is the awkward part. I've got to control some video. So I'm going there. You're going to watch the video here. Don't, you don't have to turn around. Actually, real quick, before I do that, I will give some backstory on this first video, uh, which is wash. I feel like you can't hear me well enough there. So um, we were going out and doing a marketing video, and really we were trying to, we were just putting a GoPro camera on the Warlock and a GoPro camera on the Speed Coach so that we could show people, you know, this is what's happening. Um, and I was just supposed to be the launch driver that day while the marketing group did the video. One of the guys in the boat was an intern at a pretty good college in Philadelphia working for us. And I, the coach in me came out. I couldn't bite my tongue anymore. He was doing some really awful things at the finish. So, you know, he's a, he's a pretty good rower, but he's in a double. And he's doing, you know, one of these, going way past where he should have. He's getting real low, blades popping out of the water. You know, it's pretty ugly. I'm exaggerating, but it was, it was bad enough that I was like, I think I can help you. So I went over and I took the speed coach out of his boat, went over the launch. We went about 200 meters where I just was checking his uh, finish angle and his wash, just so I could get a feel for what his numbers were. And then I handed him his speed coach back and then the video. The video is terrible because we weren't actually expecting to take video for this. So what all I'm saying here is um, I was explaining to him what those numbers were. And again, on the top, it's our finish angle. And on our bottom, it's the wash. And what we're going to try to do now is have him sit up. I don't want him anywhere near 46 degrees finish. That's just way too far. It was way too much layback. So this is the point where I give him his target now. I say, oh, you've seen what you're doing. Now go to 42. No more than 42. And we'll watch how long it takes him to get there. You're going to sit up and the hands come away. Now if you're hitting that 42, I'm going to tell you that I'm, I'm guessing you're at about 8 degrees long. Right. So you're less than the 11 or 12 you've been seeing. Is that right? Yep. Which tells me that all that extra angle from 42 to 46 is waste. Start to get back into that uh, hand stopping river to do your control. Like where you were before, where you're keeping those blades out while you're driving. That's it. Better. Okay, so for anyone who knows Philadelphia, oh, it's much better, thanks. For anyone that knows Philadelphia, um, we started this exercise about 200 meters on the other side of that bridge. That's where we started, that's where I, I gave him his speed coach. And we just rode straight down here about 300 meters through the bridge. So in about 500 meters, he understood what I meant by sit up, don't lay back so much. He knew exactly what it was. Now, when I drive away from him and I go coach somebody else, he's gonna still have me in the boat with him. Right, so that's the other powerful piece of this. I'm not leaving him anymore. He still knows 42 degrees is where he needs to be. And if he gets creeping up to 46 degrees, his wash is probably gonna go terrible as well. Okay, uh, second video I'm gonna show is, is on power. 
And this is really simple. I'm going to turn the sound off of this. Uh, the point here is I just want to, I want to illustrate in a video that if you're trying to get a certain training effect, we don't have to say three-quarter pressure anymore. We're not going to talk, we're not going to use those terms anymore. We're going to start using terms like 155 to 165 watts. That's your prescribed workout today. Or 200 watts, that's what's prescribed for this workout. No more, no less. So you're going to give them a range. And this is what they're going to see. There's no sound on this. All right, so for this example, stroke seat should be 155 to 165 watts. And now we're going to see what he sees when he's rowing. I think we're just about to start the piece. Okay, so that's what's in front of the rower. So at the top, we're seeing the instantaneous power. That's the power for his previous stroke. And at the bottom, we're seeing the average power for his interval, for his workout. So you can see he was overshooting it as he started. He had to bring himself right back down. Okay, for lack of time, I'm not going to talk about optimizing lineups and optimizing equipment. That does require some, uh, some analysis that you're going to do after a row. I'm going to focus on the things that you're doing during a row, which is optimizing coordination. So I'll show you the video first and give you some backstory on it second. This video is for coaches of team boats, both sweep and sculling. By the end of the video, you'll know why it's important to coordinate catch and finish angles of your team boat and how to do it in one workout. Here we see a boat from the coach's perspective. Even in slow motion, it's not easy to see that the rowers in this boat have a difference in their catch angles of 4 degrees and a difference in their finish angles of 6 degrees. By simply reducing the differences at the catch and finish by only two degrees, this boat saw two second improvement in their 2,000 meter pace. To do this with your crew, send your boat out with the speed coaches set in skill mode length. Let your athletes row for several minutes at full slide while they monitor their catch and finish angles. Then ask them to report their numbers. Use your judgment to determine a target catch angle and a target finish angle for the whole boat. Some athletes will need to adjust their stretchers. Others may need to adjust their body positioning. Inform your crew of their target catch angle and target finish angle. This is an iterative approach, so you may need to stop and adjust three to four times before everyone can hit their targets. This is really easy to accomplish in one session. And once you have your catch and finish angles coordinated, you can focus on improvements and slip and wash. All right, so sorry for the marketing videos, but it was actually the best illustration of these things that I had. Um, so a little backstory on this, and I've done this experiment a few times now. Um, this was with a collegiate aide in, in Philadelphia. And uh, so what we did is we, we, sent, we got the boat rigged up, and we sent this aide out with no instruction whatsoever. They had the uh, equipment in front of them. We said, don't worry about that. It's just recording some stuff. It's got some numbers. Don't worry about it. So they went out. They got warmed up. They put their foot stretchers wherever they decide they normally put them. And then they, um, we, did, we ran two pieces. We ran a piece upriver and a piece downriver. Very specifically, these were four minute pieces where every minute we increased the rate and the pressure. So they started at quarter pressure, at, I think at 24, and we bumped it up two beats every minute and we increased the pressure every minute. Now I did that so I could have a scaling of this boat. So I, I would have a, I, I didn't want to just say full pressure. So I wanted to know what they were doing over the range of their uh, pressure and, and rating. So I'd have a range of power, power to speed ratios. So we did that upriver and downriver. Then we pulled the boat aside along, along the side of the river. And I just asked them to go through their speed coaches in the memory. And we just asked them for their catch and finish angles. And quite literally, the coach and I in the launch had a piece of paper and we just scribbled them all down. So this was a super low tech way to capture their data. But we were doing it on the water, real time. 
So when we did that, we had a piece of paper just like the one shown, where we just wrote their catch and finish angles. We eyeballed them and said, 55 degrees catch, 35 degrees finish. They should all be able to hit that. You, move your foot stretchers up. You, move them back. You move them up and you sit up taller at the finish. 55, 35 guys, that's what we're gonna do. So then they went for a row, they did sort of re-warmed up. Now, looking at the displays at 55 degrees and 35 degrees. And then we re-ran the pieces. Same thing, up, up river and down river. Conditions were, were flat that day. Um, and when I, uh, then I did take the data and analyze it after the row. You don't have to do this. The effect was already done, was already complete, but I did it to check. And what I found was when I normalized the power to, uh, to 300 watts average for that boat, they went half a second per 500 meters faster. So that's where we got that two seconds over 2K. Half a second over 500 meters faster at 300 watts, normalized for 300 watts. So all the pieces we said, what was it at 300 watts? So just by virtue of getting their angles right, their timing actually got better. And then they were applying their power together. So this was free speed. And we've done this in, uh, in some sweep boats and sculling boats alike. So, I mean, that, that's easy. And I think that example is a good one to, to end up on that I think that one checked all the boxes for our goals. We were trying to give next stroke improvement to the athletes. We were trying to make it objective so that they knew if they were hitting their targets or not. We did that supplemental to the coach. This was in the confines of a normal practice. This was a 75 minute practice that the kids had to get on the bus back to school. And they could use the tool every day. And we're, I think, about eight minutes over. And that wraps it up for me. Thanks, Mike, for sure. that, and also Valerie and Milan, thanks very much. Now, just, um, we have time for about two or three questions, so if I could ask uh, Mike to come back up along with Valerie and Milan for qu any questions that we might have from anyone? Valerie as well. Any questions? Yeah, there's a question here. Hi. Hello. It's a question to Michael. Yes. It seems as if uh, you're not able to see in the launch what the rowers are seeing. Am I right? Yeah, the, uh, the, you can see, like, so in that one example where I was working with the kid on the marketing video, you can if you're within, I would say, yelling distance. So a Bluetooth distance is the tech. Is, okay, uh, so you can connect the Orlock to two devices. No, no, you would take it out of their boat. So this is a one-to-one -one system. So yeah. these, things, these things are going to talk with each other exclusively. So if you want to see it as a coach, you're going to take it out of the boat. And the now, boat cannot see it then. Now that's, that's breaking rule number one of our system. I'm not saying you can't do it, but that was breaking rule number one. We wanted the athlete to have real-time feedback, which is why that was not a focus. Not to say it isn't something that you might watch for soon, but I'm saying that wasn't our focus on the first release of the product. We wanted it real-time feedback for the athlete. Yeah, okay, but you're you are planning on doing uh, feedback for the coach simultaneously as... Uh, yes, more than planning, yes. Okay, good. Sorry, Mike, just to confirm what you just said there, the, um, if, if using speed coaches for, for speedometers, if you put two in one boat, they interfere, you don't get the same numbers from both. Now at an eight, you're putting nine of these speed coaches in a boat that you can guarantee they are not interfering with each other. They are absolutely, yeah, up. absolutely, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's done commonly now. You'll get team boats that have, you have one oar lock and one speed coach four times for a four, eight times for an eight, plus the speed coach that's in the coxswain seat. Yeah, there's no interference. Bluetooth is really good at keeping paired devices paired. I'll ask a question in, in the context of the uh, Empire Poor Lock, since that was the one I used this summer with my under-23 pair, but it's a question that I think applies to all three. Um, 
there's a fair bit of natural variation in how a rower executes every stroke. That doesn't necessarily mean that every, let's say, difference that you would see in an app or a system so is necessarily meaningful feedback. So if it's, let's say, 45 degree, sorry, 54 degrees, and a rower sees 55 degrees, is that a reason to take action? Maybe, maybe not. But in all of these systems, how do you deal with the natural variation that a row would have just more or less randomly? Um, I'm happy to take a, take a first crack at that. So if we're talking about minor variations, um, I wouldn't nitpick over, I would give a target of 55 degrees, and I'm not gonna nitpick over 54 and 56. I will at 52, and I will at 60. And when I put this on a, um, at this point, I've installed it on many team boats, and what I usually find is a difference in about 10 degrees within their boat. 10. 10. <laughs> and this is, this is for, this is for um, boats that have been training together. These are high-level boats, 10 degrees, ready to go race. I'm like, what? That's why we did some video of overhead and from the side and from behind. Uh, which I can show you separately of, well, why is it so bad? Why, why don't we see that? Well, it's actually pretty hard to see. It's, it's kind of hard to see those unless you get exactly the right spot. And obviously the large differences will be spotted, but how would you say it's, let's say, one degree is not meaningful, but four degrees is meaningful? I agree, by the way, with the numbers, but I'm just yeah. wondering well, it's based on more than intuition. What I've, what I've seen is when you give those targets, they're going to hone in right around them. Plus or minus a degree is no problem whatsoever. Just absolutely no problem. The, um, <clears throat> now, I'll say that on the catch and finish angle. Peak force is different. That, one, that one's pretty stable, but difficult to change. Hello. Um, that's impressive, all that technology. But when we go back to our clubs, we have to sell this, if I can put it like that, to the club treasurer. <laughs> now, I want you to convince me, and thus I want you to convince the club treasurer now, that all of this fantastic technology is cost effective compared with a set of straws poking up the side of the boat for catch angle and finish angle. Uh, that's fair enough, and I think Milan gave his pricing already. Do you, do you have speed coaches already in your club? A few. A few, okay. So up to that many, you don't need any more speed coaches, at least for that. And by the way, they sent the product development guy, not the sales guy, so you're not going to get the best answer here. But in, in, terms, of, um, in terms of the coach and the coach me, um, you can buy one of these. You know, you can start off with one or two and see how you like them. See if they make an impact. So if you already have two speed coaches, you could try two or locks. And then as they work for you, you can add on. All right, so that's, that's an easy way to get, get your feet wet. I have a question. Okay. Go, go ahead. You can use this. Yeah. About the cost-effective thing is, uh, by the way, this uh, core power meter is fit to any any loom, sculling or sweep or just it it is what we can do to save you money. Time for one more question. I have a question to Milan. Um, we heard the slip and wash angles, how it's defined by Nielsen Kellerman. Uh, how is your definition of, of the wash and the wash and the slip also on it Newton? Yeah, it is based on a, on a threshold, the Newton threshold, when it's uh, when a force reaches certain level. Which? At 200 Newton. 200 at slip. That, that's for the slip. For sweep. For sweep, yes. Same. Yes, yeah, so it's the same. same. Okay, the same. so basically can, it's the same. You can worry this through down to the 10, but. To the, the sensitivity of the train gauge measurement, it, it can be when you hit some some water before you do some really stroke, then suddenly it's a uh, hundred uh, newton uh, threshold. It, but hundred newton for the uh, slip and wash for the sculling and the two hundred, it's the same 
okay. obviously come to the to the same as, as yours, and that makes reasonable. Now it's good to know that you have the same measurement yeah, both systems. There is in the algorithm is a two special whether uh, force rise is 200, it's, it's becomes effective, so can drop again under 200 for sweep, and it's ineffective, and that's washed. <coughs> Great, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, just a reminder that all three presenters will be available during the lunch and in this room to, uh, uh, to provide more information or answer any of your questions you have and also demonstrate their equipment, along with the other presenters from this afternoon who will also be able to demonstrate the, uh, their, their equipment. I think lunchtime is now, Rosie, and then we will reconvene at 2 o'clock. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah.